Father in heaven, we just want to invite you to come and inhabit the praises of your people here. And wherever we're uh, singing your praise, Lord, that you just bless your church as they desire to lift up your name, as we uh, desire to encourage each other, uh, reminding each other of, our, of the promises of God, and that we would just know the, the presence of God as we praise you now. We ask you just to continue with us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father in heaven, we thank you that he that is in us is greater than he that is, is in the world. And Lord, we just bless you that we've come before your throne of grace this morning to come and worship you, to come and praise you, and just to uh, allow, um, our, our, just to, to, to be lost in the words of these songs, just to uh, magnify the name of our Saviour. And Lord, we just bless you that the very purpose that the Lord Jesus was uh, revealed was to destroy the work of the evil one, and in doing so, rescued and saved sinners such as ourselves. And so, Lord, we return praise and thanks uh, for the Lord Jesus and the fact that he went to the cross of Calvary and, and rescued sinners. Those who trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ can be rescued from the dominion of darkness. And so, Lord, we just worship you and praise you and give you thanks and ask you, Lord, to continue with us now as we turn to your word, praying that you might just bless uh, the reading of it and also as it's unfolded, as Rod comes in a moment to share from it, that he would just know that uh, help from on high, help from the one uh, who delivered uh, the, the word, it's the very word of God itself. And so Lord, we just really ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be reading from uh, 1 John. Continuing in First John, and we're going to actually just continue with the, the last verse of last week's, uh, which is uh, chapter 3 and on into the first few verses of chapter 4. So this is verse 24 of chapter 3 of the first epistle of John. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And then into chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Amen. We'll just invite Rod now to come and share from God's word.
Well, it's good to be here uh, this wonderful uh, Lord's Day as uh, we come to worship and to hear what the Lord has for us this day. Thank you to Mark and Tina for leading us in worship this morning. Uh, and may it have lifted our spirits to know the presence of God in our lives, that we are experiencing God by faith in our lives at these very difficult times. Well, we're continuing with the letters uh, that John wrote, and we're in First John at the moment. We're going to be reading, or Mark's read from uh, chapter 3, verse 24, through to uh, chapter 4, verse 16. And, and the whole series that we're looking at is the, re, the life that is real. What is your relationship with Jesus like? The life that is real. We want to live the real life. We want to be real with the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And today we're going to look at, are you walking as Christ walked? John is telling us, uh, be not deceived by the spirit of this world. Be not deceived by the spirits of this world in verses 1 to 5. Secondly, he's telling us, be discerning of truth and God's love in verses 6 to 12. And be determined to love as God has loved us in verses 13 through to 16. So these are the three points that we're going to be looking at this morning. Be not deceived by the spirits of this world. Be discerning of the truth and God's love and be determined to love as God has loved us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Be not deceived by the spirits of this world. John warns us against believing every spirit. We must never assume that every spiritual experience or spiritual power is from God. We must test spiritual experiences to see if they are in fact from God. By its nature, being deceived means we don't realise it. If you realise you're being deceived, then you're no longer being deceived. Therefore, we need to know the word of God and check everything we hear against his word. The word of God is a plumb line that everything is compared to. And so we need to know it. We need to know what the absolute truth of God's word is so that we can compare everything to it to see whether it's true or not. John knew the danger of false prophets. And this message was very real to the early church. The danger of false teachers is that they are sincere in their error. And that's what makes them dangerous. So it's important that the word preached and taught is tested by the body of Christ. It's tested by the church so that they know the truth. Everything that is preached here from the pulpit needs to be checked against the word of God. And it's the body that has the responsibility to do that. In 2 Peter, Peter writes, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy has ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So how do we know when a false prophet speaks? 
Well, John tells us, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. True prophecy, true prophecy, true teaching will present a true Jesus. In John's day, the issue was, did Jesus come in a real body of flesh and blood? They couldn't understand that Jesus, being God, could have come in the flesh and blood as a human being. Because God is holy and humans are impure. The people didn't have a hard time believing Jesus was God. But they did have a hard time believing that he was a real man. This false teaching said Jesus was truly God, but really a make-believe man. Jesus is truly God and truly man. He's 100% God and 100% man, because both the deity and humanity of Jesus are essential to our salvation. He has to be a man to die upon a cross. And he has to be God to forgive us our sins. Many modern academics say that they want to discover the true Jesus. And when they say this, they often mean the true Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. They say the biblical Jesus is make-believe. They base their understanding of Jesus on their own personal opinions. And they present it as a fact. And that's what makes them dangerous. A Jesus of their own understanding, not the Jesus of the Bible. The spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit which both opposes the true Jesus and offers a substitute Jesus. The devil doesn't care if you know Jesus or love Jesus or pray to Jesus as long as it's a false Jesus, a make-believe Jesus, a Jesus who's not there and who cannot save. The spirit of Antichrist is present with us today in our churches. It is found everywhere a false Jesus is promoted in a place, in the place of a true Jesus, the true Jesus of the Bible. We need to guard against the false and we must know the truth. It was uh, when they were training the tellers in the Bank of England that they would spend time examining the true £20 notes that the tellers would be so familiar with the, the real £20 notes that they would know them intimately. That whenever someone handed in a false note, they would pick it up immediately. It's because they'd spent time knowing the real truth, the real notes, that they would identify the falsehood when they came across it. And that's like us with the Word of God. We need to know the truth. We need to know His Word. And we need to put our uh, truth, a uh, trust in that. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We need not fear the spirit of Antichrist, because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When we walk as Christ walked, in truth, we have the victory and we have the assurance. This means we have no place for fear, for faith drives out fear. And then in verse 5, therefore they, that's the false teachers, speak from the world and the world listens to them. Those who talk from a, a worldly perspective are influenced by the world. 
and they don't face rejection because they're friends with the world. But we need to be discerning of the truth and of God's love. In verse 6, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You know who is God's because we have fellowship with God. We understand the language of fellowship which transcends culture. It transcends class. It transcends race or any other barrier. We walk in the spirit of truth by walking as Christ walked, as he said, I am the truth. You know when you're talking to a fellow believer, there's a connection by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. And you know when you're not. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. A more accurate translation would be, those who are loved, let us love. We're not commanded to love one another, to earn or become worthy of God's love. We love one another because we are loved by God and have received that love and live in light of that love. What John is saying here is when we really experience God, it will show by our love for one another. Note that this love is not perfected in our life on this side of eternity. Though it may not be perfected, it needs to be present and it should be growing. You can't truly grow in your experience of God without also growing in love for one another. And that's why John can boldly say, he who does not love does not know God. If there isn't real love for God's people in your life, then your claim to know God and experience God isn't true. God's kind of love comes into our life through our relationship with him. If we want to love one another more, we need to draw closer to God. We need that relationship to be right with God in order to love one another. It starts with our relationship with him and it is channeled through us to our relationship with others. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a, the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This shows us what love is and what love means. Firstly, the greatness of God's love is not only defined by the sacrifice of Jesus, but also by the giving of the Father. It was the love of the Father that sent his Son as a sacrifice. Secondly, the greatness of God's love is not only in the sending of the Son, but also in what the sending accomplishes for us. It brings us life when we trust in Jesus, because he is the propitiation for our sins. And propitiation here really has the idea of a sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God. On the cross, Jesus took the punishment for our sins. He sacrificed, turned away the judgment we should receive. We easily think how this shows the love of Jesus, but John wants us to understand it also shows the love of God the Father. He loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, that we might live through him. 
And then the last point here, the greatness of God's love is shown not only in saving us from the judgment we deserve, but also in wanting us to live through him. Do we live through him? This is the greatest way to define the Christian life, to live through him. God gave his son to die and to die for sinners. We can think of someone uh, paying a great price to save someone deserving, deserving, someone good, someone wholesome, someone noble, someone who had done much for them. But God did this for rebels, for sinners, for those who had turned their backs on him. Real love, agape love, is not defined by our love for God, but his love for us. His love for us is the beginning of our relationship with him. We can't love God the way we should unless we are receiving and living in his love. Our love for God doesn't really say anything great about us. It is only the common sense response to knowing and receiving his love. It just makes complete sense. If you had a, a pipe that was clogged and water was going into it but not coming out, that pipe would be useless. You would need to remove the blockage or even replace it. And God pours his love into us that it might flow out from us. And if there is any blockage in us, then the love will not flow through. So God wants to clear us, clean us, and fill us so that his love can flow through us. Is there a blockage in your pipe? Is there something stopping the love of God flowing through you to your brothers and sisters in Christ? In verse 12 it says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Anyone claiming to have seen God the Father is speaking from their own imagination. If we really walk as Christ walked, then God's love towards us will be evident in our love for one another. And this word perfected in us is, is talking about maturity. When we are showing love for each other, it is showing maturity because we understand what God's love to us really is. We need to be determined to love as God loves us. In verses 13 to 15, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. We can know by experience that we live in God and his love has been perfected in us. And then we will love one another. It's simple. Our abiding in Jesus is not one-sided affair. John brings up the work of the Holy Spirit in us as this points to, for two important connections. Firstly, it is the Spirit of God in us that is the abiding presence of Jesus. And secondly, it's the testimony of the Holy Spirit within us that makes it possible for us to know that we abide in him. John declares three essential truths about who God is and how he saves us. Firstly, knowing that the Father has sent the Son. Secondly, knowing that Jesus has sent, was sent as the Saviour of the world. And lastly, knowing that Jesus abides in us by faith. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and God abides in him and he in God, you see, it isn't enough to know the facts about Jesus, 
We must confess the truth. And, and the idea here is that, that, that confess means to be in agreement with. We must agree with God about who Jesus is. And we find this in his word. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And it reminds me of the story of an eight-year-old boy who had a younger sister who was dying of leukemia. And he was told that without a blood transfusion, she would surely die. His, exp his parents explained to him that his blood was probably a compatible match with hers. And if so, he could be the blood donor. They asked him if they could test his blood, and he said, sure. So they did, and it was a good match. They then asked if he would give his sister a pint of his blood. That it would be her only chance of living. He said he would have to think about that overnight. Well, the next day came, and he went to his parents, and he said, yep. Yeah, I'm willing to donate my blood. So they took him to the hospital where he was put on a bed beside his six-year-old sister. A nurse drew a pint of blood from the boy, which was then put into his sister's drip. The boy lay on the bed beside her, silent, while the blood dripped into his sister until the doctor came over to see how he was doing. The boy opened his eyes and asked, how soon until I start to die? He thought by giving his blood, he was going to die. Now that's a love sacrifice. He thought by donating his blood, he was going to sacrifice his own life for that of his sister. Now that's our proper response to who God is and how he loves us. We are called to take the love and grace God gives, to know it by experience and to believe it, and then to sacrificially put it into practice. God wants us to respond by knowing, by experiencing, by believing the depth of his love for us, his sacrificial love for us. And when we have this kind of relationship with God, we will be immersed in God's love and we become his place of abiding and then we will truly be walking as Christ walked. Are you determined to live out this love towards others? Putting them before yourself. Being sacrificial in your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. For that shows that we're abiding in him and he is abiding in us. Let us pray. Oh Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message today. Lord, that you would guard us against the false teachers that you would lead us into all truth, that we would know your presence and we would know the abiding of your love, that we would live a life that is determined by you and your word, by your indwelling within us to transform our lives so that we become a channel of your love, that we're like that pipe that the blockage is taken away so that your love can flow through us to others. And this then gives us the assurance that we are in you and that you are in us and that we know you. Not a head knowledge or a, an intellectual understanding of you, but an experiential understanding that we see your love and that we are a channel of your love. 
And so, Lord, as we come to you this morning, may this message really resonate with us. And Lord, if there is no love in us, may we question our relationship with you. May we turn to you and repent of our sin and know the filling of the Holy Spirit upon our souls and that you would lead us into all truth. Guard us against the falsehood and bring us into the knowledge of your truth that the truth is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Bless us now this morning, for we ask you in and through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And now we're going to hand back to Mark and Tina for the, the final hymn as we lift our voices uh, in our own homes uh, to praise and worship the living God. Thank you, Rod. We will now close the, the service with the, the final song, which is How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
at the crucified one, realizing that we ourselves were involved in that terrible act. We were the ones that really put Jesus on the cross. It was our sin that, that, that put him there. And Lord, we just are so grateful and so thankful that the, the crucified one had our names on his lips when he was dying there. You had our names before the foundation of the world, of course. But Lord, we just thank you that we benefit for eternity from the death and resurrection uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ as he came and destroyed uh, the work of hell and sin and death and the devil. Lord, we just bless you and praise you and just want to worship uh, the one who died there for us. And so we just worship you this morning, praying, Lord, that you would continue with us into this new week, Lord, and that you might be honoured by the, the, your church in these days as we live for you in all things. And so thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>